You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to episode 182 of the Anxiety Podcast. This week's episode is... Is particularly special for me. I've got a friend on here, somebody I've been trying to get on for an interview for probably a year, and I'm not even joking. I will give you an, a full introduction to him in a moment. Before I do so, head on over to anxietypodcast.com. Have you got yourself a journal yet? Um, been getting some, got some great feedback the other day from, from people who were using the journal. And, uh, if you're on the website, you just click on store, I think, and then the journal tab and it will tell you all about it. But the purpose of the journal is to give you a physical resource to support you on a day to day basis. There's beautiful quotes in there. There's lovely illustrations done by one of our own listeners. I would love for you to get a copy of it and start to write in it every day and for it to kind of support you. As I said, that's what it's all about. If you would like to jump on the phone with me and uh, talk about one-on-one coaching, then please go to the coaching tab on the website, uh, scroll down through, have a read, see if it's a, a fit for you. And at the bottom, you can just schedule a call with me. Um, pick a time that works and we'll jump on the phone and see if coaching is something that's going to help you move forward and kind of take that next step in your evolution, get you to start cultivating some confidence, something we're going to talk about today and moving in the right direction. Um, and again, I go back to this a lot, but the, the one-on-one coaching is very, very close to my heart. It's very important to me because it's exactly what I wish I had uh, when I was struggling the most. And, and truthfully, what I think can give you the, the biggest or, or the quickest um, you know, return to a, a life that you really enjoy. And actually, not even that, but a, a bigger life is about considering what's possible in the future. A lot of people say, I want to get back to the way I was before. No, that's part of the reason why we're here. I want you to get back to, I want you to get to the, the future version of you, which is new and improved and informed and has depth and, and character and all sorts of good stuff. So let's talk about that. I want to talk about it. If you'd like to join the Facebook group, Click on the button on the front of the website. You can join the Less Anxiety More Life Facebook group. Okay, this week's guest is a really good friend of mine. Um, I mentioned him a a couple of weeks ago on the show. Ricardo Labaran is somebody I've been spending a lot of time with over the last few years. We're in uh, some similar groups where we go on retreats and we're trying to improve our lives. You know, a lot of the stuff that I talk about on this podcast is what we're talking about in real time. Um, Our physical bodies, our nutrition, our mental minds, I'm not even sure that's articulating it right, whatever. We're trying to improve our bodies and our minds and our our lives and our families and where we live and our situations and everything. And a lot of the conversations we've had in the past, I was like, man, we should have been recording that for TAP, as Ricardo calls it, TAP. So we're going to call it TAP now. We should have been recording that. That'd be so cool to share with the listeners because we just start to, we create space for these amazing conversations and then we just get into it. So that's what we're going to start doing with you. Today's the first one. If you like it, more will follow. So without further ado, let me introduce you to my main man, Ricardo. Here we go. Okay, so Ricardo Laboran, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. I am thrilled to be here, Timothy, my friend. This is great. We've been uh, trying to make this happen for weeks on end. This is great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it feels like a long time in the making, my friend, for sure. It was, yes. So, Ricardo, you may already be a little bit famous with some of the Anxiety Podcast listeners because you've been mentioned in other shows, but... Probably what would be fantastic is if you could start off by telling us in your own words a bit about your own background, a bit about your own history, so that the wonderful people listening can get to know you a little bit better. Is that okay, my friend? Oh, of course. Uh, The story where you and I connected will be very cool to uh, to talk about on a piece-by-piece thing, but uh, my story is as follows. Um, I'm Mexican. I was born and bred in Mexico. I'm living in Mexico country as we speak. Uh, And uh, my background is kind of a traditional becomes completely 
less traditional by the moment situation. Um, uh, my, my work background is mostly finance. At one point, I became uh, the head of an investment banking team, team for a Swiss bank in Mexico, which it's fair to say was pretty darn exciting. We were doing some uh, com complex financial transactions. We were working with the Uber of the Uber uh, companies in Mexico, big ones. I, was I lived in New York for a couple of years. I was traveling around the world. So it was a very, very fun, very exciting, engaging career. Uh, that's, that's my job background and my personal background, which I really dislike, you know, the separation of both, but for TAP, uh, listeners, this would, would, uh, would work. I'm, um, I'm completely a nature buff. I love hunting. I love fishing. I love being in the outdoors, hiking. Uh, I'm a father of three. I have three small kids, uh, five, a three and a one year old. Uh, I've been happily married for seven years now, and I'm living in beautiful, beautiful Cabo San Lucas in the southern tip of the Baja Peninsula. Yeah, well, that is uh, very cool. And thank you for, for sharing that. You paint, paint a very rosy picture, but I remember some slightly darker version you telling me when you were down an alleyway clutching your chest and you couldn't breathe and uh, times are a bit tougher. So I wonder if you could go into a bit more detail on that side of the house. What do you think? <laughs> of course, we're getting into the gravy stuff. I like this. Um, a bit more, a bit of a wider background is um, my family, both on my mother's side and my father's side are historically anxiety sufferers, whatever that means in th this day and age. Okay. But looking back at that, there's, there's, there's always been a strain of, uh, of anxiety, both, uh, pop and mom side. So it might be the case that I've suffered from different types or intensities of anxiety before, but I wasn't able to really, you know, put a, put a, the, the face to the name until 2011. That was a great year because I had my first child, Alessa. And as all of uh, your listeners that are par parents know, know, having the first kid is just it's a climax event, right? It's a summit on all fronts. And what happened after that is, and I'll give you a, the, the, the detailed description of what happened and you're going you're gonna to know uh, and, and your listeners will benefit from this. When my first kid was a couple of months old, we went out uh, for a Sunday brunch I was living in Mexico City at the time. And all was fine and dandy. At least that's what I thought uh, at the time. And we had a marvelous uh, meal. And we were tired because we had gone out uh, night prior. Sophia and I, my wife, came back to the house and took a nap. And... 40 minutes later, I woke up, heart racing, palms sweating, my face red like a sugar beet. And I was like, what, what is this? What's happening? What's going on? And my heart started racing and palpitations and weird thoughts going through my head. And then it subsided, like for... A couple of minutes and then it went away completely. And I walked out, walked out my, my room all, all googly eyed. And I said to my wife, like, this weird thing happened and they felt weird. And my heart started racing out of nowhere. What is that? And she was like, oh, nothing, whatever. 15 minutes later, here we go again, right? Boom, 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 boom. My ears start, you know, like this 
bumping sound and I could feel my veins in the neck. And I started, you know, like rabbit holing pretty fast on this. My first thought is, okay, my heart is going to explode. The, the full X amounts of liters of blood that I have in me are going to spill all over. This is going to be dramatic. And the, vol- the volume just started shooting up through the roof. My brother, my younger brother was living in Mexico City at the time. I phoned him up and I said, man, take me to the hospital because I'm think- I think I'm dying. He was like, what? I just saw you in the morning. You were fine. And I just yelled, you know, like completely um, uh, uncomfortable and unpronounceable words in Spanish to him in the line. And he came over immediately to take me to the hospital. I went to the hospital. They drew blood. They did this. They taped a lot of stuff to me. And I kept on saying like, I'm young, I, uh, I'm, I, I exercise, I eat well, blah, blah, blah. And I don't know what's happening. And then I had another of what we now know were panic attacks in the ER. And that guy attending the ER was like 15 years old or something. He was like, oh my God, well, your heart is racing. What's happening? We don't know what, this is weird. So you must, you must imagine that uh, I, I flipped some more. So I'm, I'm making this uh, story a bit long uh, to make a point because uh, most of your listeners might be situated in Canada or in the U.S. In Mexico, anxiety is even more misunderstood than in our northern neighbors. So nobody knew what was, what was going on. So after that, I felt weird for weeks, then months, and then uh, the whole story you now know uh, took me, me quitting my job, moving cities, dropping 30 pounds, becoming super healthy, having a great family life. And it all started with me being in the hospital, having a panic panic attack. Mm. I never really thought about this before, but um, my first major meltdown was in 2011 as well. So maybe that's why we get on so well, because we have uh, synchronized panic attacks and we started to go through some of those hardships at around the same time. But I never thought about that before. It's interesting. Oh, I, I didn't realize that. That's cool. Yeah. So, but, but yours doesn't count because your, your, your thing was public speaking and everybody has that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Oh, thank you for your understanding and care. Um, yeah, but I guess there are some, there's, there's quite a lot of similarities that run through our stories. And for both of us, you know, I think one of the byproducts of this has been that we've sort of turned around and taken our lives, which were full of complexity and full of busyness and chasing the money and chasing the dream and and chasing the next title or pay rise and we've really simplified it um and kind of both become sort of budding minimalists you talked about nature which is which is true for me and just having less you know just not as much stuff completely completely and the other thing which i realized when we were in walking the streets of dublin where the streets have no name, good old U2, and uh, we're, we're walking around, and I realized that, you know, one of my favorite activities to to do, one of my favorite things to get out and do is to just walk around and just observe, you know, I, some people call it people watching, but just getting out on the streets and taking time to do that, it's it's a big deal for me now, I really enjoy that. That's it. In the old days, we'll be scrambling for the best nightclub or the best hot cuisine place in Dublin or sightseeing or doing this or that, you know, and punching the thing and scraping the, scraping the tourist card. But now it's just walking around and having a laugh at things and then just shooting out ideas. That's fertile ground. And <laughs> when we remove the stimulus, not all the stimulus, but most of the stimulus, then what, what, what's going on? You just made me think of that uh, when we were walking through the, the streets of Dublin and that guy came out of a pub or he was going into a pub and he just pulled over on the side of the road and started peeing on the side of the building and just standing there in broad daylight in the rush hour traffic. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> oh, 
noticed. Yeah, it was so weird. It was just like, okay, why are we the only ones noticing this guy taking a slash on the side of the pub? And uh, it was it was totally in public, you know? It was just out there for all to see. No, no, no. But Real proof that nobody's actually paying attention to anything that's going on around them. No, and, and, and for the audience, just picture this. This is Rush Hour Dublin. It's a huge bus stop. There's There might be more than 100 people standing there. And this guy comes out, takes out his private parts, uh, for lack of a better word, takes a piss in the sidewalk. And, and mind you, this was not a bum guy. He, he, wasn't, a, he wasn't living on the streets. He was well-dressed or you know, even shaved, clean-shaved or something. So nobody noticed because everybody and their mothers were peeking at their phones in the bus stop. Yep, everybody was heads down. So that's, that's symptomatic of what we're having. We're so scared of having some sort of downtime or quiet time. We can have quiet time in, in, in the middle of chaos, but that's, that's a cool thing. I didn't remember that one. Yeah, that guy just peed away his sadness in the, in, in the streets of Dublin. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, and then the other thing that happened, like, I don't know, it seems like it was around the same time, but five minutes after that, we're walking past another bus stop and, uh, there's a girl stood there. She's got like a huge phone. It must've been like an iPhone seven or something. And she's like, okay, you know, texting away. And all of a sudden this guy goes past on a push bike and like rips it out of her hand. And I think he dropped it cause she got it back, but he dropped it. He was going super fast, didn't even stop. And Again, just nobody's paying attention. Nobody saw this guy flying down the road ready to make an attempted robbery. Everybody's too busy looking down again, <laughs> you know? And uh, it was just interesting. And, and that's kind of one of the big insights I've taken away from the sessions we have really, uh, and I've talked about this on the podcast a lot, and I will continue to because it's so important, the ability to disconnect. Um, and when we get together, you know, we switch our phones off purposefully, put them in our pockets, sit down, hands on the table. It's like, right, what are we talking about? Eye contact. Like, this is a serious business. And the art of conversation is a dying one if the whole time we, we have these distractions going on between us. Exactly. And it sounds all, you know, f very cool, fine and dandy when you hop on a plane for 12 hours and end up in Ireland with no agenda. But we must understand that this is in a, in an earlier stage, this would have been completely unfathomable for you or, or for me. Right. So, so you earn, you earn that spot by doing five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, you're turning the phone off at 7.30 or 8 or whatever, not checking the news or social media feeds one hour prior to going to bed or one hour after waking up. Those are small things. We, 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 the, it, when we talk about it, it's, it, in a certain sense, it seems insurmountable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine if you get a 10 days to be blocked off and this and that, right? But it starts, you know, like very subtle, very slow, right? You earn your way through that, uh, that thing. Mm. Yeah, and I think the for people listening, like, how the fuck do you get to that place? What, how do I start? I think step one is recognizing the resistance, um, for want of a better term. So we talk about curiosity when it comes to anxiety. Well, feel that, you know, go to a place of curiosity when you're like, oh, I desperately need to check my phone again, even though I only checked it five minutes ago. Feel that resistance. What does it feel like that you're, you're anticipating that little shot of goodness in your brain? And we need to get used to resisting that and just sitting with it and saying, all right, I checked it five minutes ago. Nothing material is going to have changed. I'll look at it again in the future because, and then to start to batch and silo those times to check because really it's about connection. And if we can't be present with the person in front of us, you know, that is becoming a scarce resource to connect, you know? Exactly. 
And exactly. And connecting is everything. It doesn't seem like it in the surface, but connecting is everything. You know? uh, we must understand that inside our thick skulls, we're still pretty primitive. We're pre pretty primitive beings with a super developed uh, prefront prefrontal cortex, right? You, you, sp you speak about health all the time. So let's say we take the brightest of humanity and we place them in a cool enclave in near San Francisco and they churn out all these beautiful devices and systems, right? No wonder we get hooked to those. So te technology is beautiful and it's lovely, but it's a two-edged sword, right? The, the, the best thing would be like to harness the power and the energy to be connected and to be flying around and still uh, be conducting business and be in touch with family and everything, but not get uh, addicted, like you, like you say. And, and, I, and it happens to me still, right? After all this, uh, quote-unquote, um, awareness and wisdom and blah, 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 I still find myself, you know, like, mindlessly refreshing some pages or mindlessly checking my email 15 times a day where there's no, e there's no important emails coming. And, and if, if it's important enough, I'm going to find out soon. So we, we trigger this scarcity thing going around looking for the big email. You know, it's like the, 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 the white uh, uh, laboratory mice, you know, pulling the lever a thousand times a day in, uh, in exchange for a, for a piece of M&M. <laughs> no? Who doesn't love M&Ms? Come on. Um, <laughs> but uh, sorry, I, sorry to bring up the, the old man's willy again. But when you go back to that example of that guy taking a leak outside of the pub, the thing, the other thing that it made me think about was who's not paying attention and, and kind of what are we paying attention to? And, you know, I believe that what we put our minds to is what we get. So the guy who reads the muscle and fitness magazine and learns about nutrition and works out, he's probably going to have a good body. He's probably going to get that eventually. The guy who reads about mutual funds and is into all of his stock trading and stuff, he's probably going to at some point do well financially, he's probably going to have a good financial acumen. So the question then becomes, if we are filling our minds with, you know, FOMO, bad news stories, um, the latest political, uh, you know, stuff that's going on, social media feeds, other people's highlight reels, as some people call them, then what are we, you know, what are we programming ourselves for what we setting ourselves up for, it doesn't sound like success. It sounds like, you know, almost like a, an observer type role in the world, which is interesting. Exactly. Snippets of information don't amount to anything nutritious. It's uh, intellectual junk food. Uh, and we as humans, we need the depth. We need to create that depth. And uh, you said something that just stirred my... My, my heart over here and said, what else might we be missing? What else might we be missing by, you know, staring at our screens? Basically 24 seven. It's not even one screen. And, and we're not trying to make this uh, become a rant. But we can't, we're still guilty of it. You know, sometimes. We're, we're, exactly. No, no, no. But we, but we, we yeah, we're fl floating this awareness to see what, What's on the other side of things? Mm. I remember uh, th there was this uh, ancient, ancient, ancient device called the BlackBerry. I don't know if you remember that one. The CrackBerry, of course I do. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Continuous hits of dopamine throughout the day, right? Amazing. No, not even, not even a, candy, a candy store would match that uh, small... Uh, by, uh, vibrating piece of technology, but um, it's just the BlackBerry back in the day, and now our beautiful iPhone or the non-exploding Samsungs. Um, they rob us. They 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 do rob us. We we allow technology to rob us of the actual real life going on. 
because real life is going on. I went to a small ranch yesterday and I, I become friends with a couple of, you know, retired old Canadian and, and American guys back here in Cabo. And the wisdom these guys have is just off the charts, off the charts. Mind you, these are all unconventional people, unconventional folk, right? Really fit into their 70s and 80s, eating healthy, surfing at 6, at 6 a.m., you know, and living life on their own terms. And this guy was, this is it's Jerry, a Canadian guy. Um, he's 60 plus, And we were having lunch and this rustic uh, ranch, like a 40-minute drive from my place. We were having lunch with the kids and we were all laughing, no cell phone signal, no nath- nothing. We were having like this organic feast with the garden vegetables and bean burritos and stuff like that. And somebody mentioned something about the old, like the good old days. And they, and somebody said, I don't remember who was this, but somebody said like, oh, this was like in the good old days. Ha ha ha. And this guy, Jerry interrupted and he said, what you don't realize is the good old days are happening right now. These are the good old days right now. We're going to look back on these 20 years forward and we're going to say, oh my God, those were the good old days. We fail to realize that there's, they're happening right now. And most of our talks, Tim, uh, are around this kind of concepts of how we can live more mindful, you know, be there and make things happen as well. We, we confuse the things. We, we think we have to be like going bananas 100 miles an hour to make things happen when things happen when they want to happen, right? Ah, the good old days, yeah. I mean, it's kind of, it makes me think of, um, you know, when people are on their deathbeds and they say, what do you, you know, what would you change about your life? And people say, oh, I wish I'd been more present with people. It was never about money. It's always about kind of connection with family and connection with friends. And I think in the future, people are going to be on their deathbed and they're going to be like, I wish I didn't spend so much fucking time on Facebook, check it, like refreshing my page or checking my emails. Like, I wish I'd just been present more in my life and and showed up more for the people around me um and again like we said this is a reminder for us not just for for people listening this is uh putting it on on record because for me when i do go out and i leave my phone at home on purpose and i get out in nature and i go for the walk and i kind of feel the wind and listen to the birds uh, um that feels like it's something a departure but actually, that's the real world. Like, the real world exists around us all the time. The artificial one we've created is the one that we, we, we're struggling with at the moment. That's the way I see it. Of course. Of course. And you know what the added bonus for that is? When you come back from a couple of hours hiking nature, you'll have a ton of messages. And it'll be fun because there'll be novelty in your phone again. It enhances both the, the things. It enhances nature and you come back and you have new pictures or new cats or new something that some politician said or not some XYZ sports or whatever, man. But, but there's new stuff to be seen, right? So it's double whammy. Mm. And people always think they're going to miss things, but uh, in my experience, you know, people would probably make more money and be more successful if they just said, you know, I'm actually just going to check my phone once a day instead of all the time. I'll tell you something really personal, just between you and I, okay? Just between. Make me that pinky promise, man. Done. But uh, I promise. <laughs> it is not the money. I can say that on a first-person basis. It's money's a tool. It's It's... Super cool to have it around. It's super cool to make it. It's um, it, it brings a feeling of safety and security when you have some stash around or some savings. But that's just about it. It's it's amazing. But the thing is, for most of us, we have to go through the arc of finding that out. Via the hard way. 
we're funny in that situation. Even other mammals, primates or, you know, like deer and stuff, they see something happen to other, other species and they go like, whoa, I'm not going to repeat that. And we are not like that. I've been in the, you know, in the height of finance, the finance career, we we are, are my coworkers and I were making tons of money. We're talking seven figure money on a yearly basis in us dollar terms. And it's not it. Mm. Absolutely. And I understand that p- 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 people who are stretched for money right now, might that money thing might pop up to the forefront on, you know, like at every twist and turn, but things have changed. I, I am sure that 99.9% of people listening to a TAP are not going to go hungry in the next couple of years. They're, they might not switch cars. They might not trade up to a, to a fancy German automobile or dress in Senya clothes and Ferragamo shoes. They might not, right? But they're not going to go hungry. We are not going to go hungry. But the mind is a tricky, it's a tricky computer. No, it tricks us, tricks us into say, into saying, oh my God, if I don't make this, if I don't get this race, if I don't get this promotion, if I don't get this new job, if I, if I don't work double time or triple time or whatever, I'm going to go hungry and my kids and my family is going to go hungry as well. And that's just not the case. Right. It's very, and, and, and it's, this is something I've been pondering uh, after Ireland because, and, and, and you know, uh, bar- borrowing from a previous conversation we had a couple of minutes ago, in evolutionary terms, if something went wrong, it went pretty wrong very fast, right? So you break an ankle uh, 100,000 years ago, you were saber tooth tiger lunch. That was it. Or the tribe you were, you, we belonged, we belonged in. They just said, "Oh man, you're slowing us down. We're gonna tie you to this, to this uh, eucalyptus over here and have luck, uh, have good luck, right?" But, but that's not the case anymore. If we break an ankle right now, we're gonna have a cast for a couple of weeks, and that's gonna be it. And most folk hearing this. They're not going to even have to pay for it via insurance and stuff like that. But we're still thinking, we're still having that mentality, that extreme risk mentality where it doesn't exist anymore. And we play small because we, we, we play the cards not to lose anything instead of focusing on living better or living healthier, on, the, on, on not being happy because happy is a completely subjective term, but being more satisfied, more fulfilled. Mm. It's interesting because we, we've talked about this before as well, about how people don't learn through osmosis or, or vicariously. They need to um, make their own mistakes. They need to build up their fortune and realize that money isn't the answer or isn't the only thing that's important and that they need to to kind of figure out other stuff in their lives as well. So, you know, the the purpose I think of of this kind of discussion isn't necessarily for people to be able to bypass that because I'm not sure if that's even possible, but hopefully they can listen to this and say, you know, just get better a better overview, a better amount of knowledge so that they can kind of go into into battle knowing um what the potential outcomes might be and what the future might look like for them and you know, that was certainly the case for me. I, I, you know, somebody could have said anything to me and I would have said, right, thanks very much for your advice, but I'm actually going to do what I want to do. I'm going to try and build up this successful business career and get the title I'm after. And, you know, it took something significant to slow me down. It took the slap around the face to make me kind of readdress things and consider that, you know, maybe a different alternative was, was really what I was looking for because otherwise I'm not sure I would have slowed down, you know, and that's why anxiety can be such a, a great reminder that things need to change, that we can't keep on the same way. Exactly. 
Exactly. And, 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 and you, we said that, <laughs> we said that right now, humans, we are not good at learning vicariously. So if you take a child and you explain to that child, the physics, the thermodynamics of grabbing a boiling pot of water and how she's going to, she or he is going to get burned. They're not going to listen. They have to grab it, right? They have to touch the stove. So we, we don't change. We're we, in a sense, we're the same. And I know your clients, uh, direct clients, and I know your listeners are feeling the same way, but it, it is not. And I'll, I'll give you an example that happened to me. Um, to be honest, anxiety is the, in, in hindsight, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. And it's, it's just so counterintuitive to say that, you know, aside from meeting my spouse, having my kids, you know, the big things, but in my life, uh, in recent times, just having panic attacks out of whack and, you know, being 30,000 feet in the air, uh, in a plane and having a panic attack and not knowing if screaming or crying or asking for more whiskey was the, uh, the answer. And, and now I, I'm, I'm just, I'm a so much better version of myself that, that, than I was uh, even a couple of years ago. I feel so much better. It's, it's amazing. Just, and, and, and for, for the, the tribe listening to this, It might seem, seem uh, a curse when it's happening, but it serves a purpose. And time will tell and time will vote in your favor, right? So when we're anxious or when we're having a, a very big spike or an attack, our, our life is just signaling. It's a signaling device. Aside from the, the very adverse medical cases, you know, the, the, the Six Sigma situations far, far out, but uh, it's just a signaling mechanism where our body is telling us that something's wrong and we're still doing it again and again and again. Just a way for our body and our mind to defend themselves from us, you know? Yeah, I like that. Our body and mind to defend themselves from us. That's really cool. And the reality is in this situation, we're not trying to necessarily teach people vicariously anyway in terms of what the podcast does. Because if you're listening to the anxiety podcast, then you probably searched anxiety. So you might have some anxiety in your life. Welcome to the club. You're in the right place. Um, but what it does do is allow us to, to hopefully help people on the flip side to say, right, you've, you've now find yourself anxious. Let's support you through the other side of it because we know if you go to the doctor you're going to walk out in most cases with a bag full of pills which in most cases aren't going to make you feel better um and so you know the podcast is really i, I go back to saying it's something i would have liked myself i'm trying to provide a service which i would have liked to connect with i would have liked to listen to i would have liked to have somebody to speak to when i was feeling the shame and the embarrassment and the isolation and feeling like I was the first person in the world to kind of have these sorts of symptoms. So that's really, I think, uh, you know, the interesting from the, from the vicarious point of view that we discuss. But, you know, similarly to what you said, I also see my anxiety as a blessing, as, as an opportunity to provide some richness in my life a hard rock to kind of push up against so that now I kind of strive for better and I try and make my life better and improve it I have really a a, a, a depth of contrast to compare between what life was like and now what I'm kind of having of course and I, I didn't get to meet the old version of Tim but the new version of Tim he's uh He's a, he's a, he's a beast. Man. <laughs> the old version of Tim was a dick. So. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe the old version and the new version are pretty much alike then. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. 
<laughs> I don't know if uh, I don't know if um, the old version of Tim would have really appreciated the contrast or the difference. Yes, of course, and you know the traditional route. And for the listeners' benefit, what happened on my particular situation was I was so high performing and so happy and so good looking and making so much money that I didn't want it to end. So I kept at it uh, for a couple of more months. And, uh, and as, as we all know, that didn't work. So one time I broke down crying at one of my um, boss's office. And he was like, oh, my God, what's going on? This is uncomfortable. Um, and he said, like, okay, so I'll... I'll uh, I'll recommend the doctor that, quote unquote, my friends go to. And, uh, and he's going to help you out because this is very common. You're young and you just had kids and you're, you're feeling a pang of responsibility and this and that. So I went to the doctor with uh, many, many leather bound books in a big office with, you know, like, like chocolate colored big leather couches and cool magazines. And the guy was wearing cool glasses and everything. He was an old guy. So I described the situation and I was looking for something to describe this verbatim, right? I was looking for a silver bullet, like a magic answer and say like, Oh yeah, this happens all the time. You're going to be fine. This is something that will cure in 10 to 15 days. If you take this and that and the other. So I described the situation and he said like, no, because the synapses are firing and like this and that and wherever in your brain and you lost the connection to fill in the blank, whatever medical terms they use and take this pill. Uh, it's, uh, nothing's going to happen. And in six months, you're going to be the same old version of yourself. Don't worry. You're going to come back to base and it's going to be great. And those six months were as close to hell on earth as I've, as I've uh, experienced because I couldn't get it up for one, for once. Uh, I lost appetite. I lost a lot of weight, but in, you know, in the bad way, like, skinny fat, not strong skinny, which is the way we are now in case you guys haven't met us. <laughs> um, and it was ridiculous, but I, I, but I, I just like, I, I had to, you know, I had to grab onto something in the stormy waters that I was going through. And, but I got curious and I started digging deeper and deeper and I, uh, and a friend of mine attended meditation. So I started going to meditation and I became good friends with the teacher. So I s told my story and they supported my weaning off of the pills. And then I realized uh, that my dad had the same exact pattern that I had. And he, he grappled with major, major pill addiction for years. And we're talking pretty major strong pills, you know, like the proverbial uh, emptying of the bottle daily. Um, and that got me scared. And I was, I had a lot going for me. I was, I, 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 was still, I still am, but I, I was very young and I had a daughter and I was healthy and I had a, and Sophia, my wife, she was supportive, but she was extremely scared and didn't know what was going on. I, you know, sleep, having sleepless nights and crying locked up in the bathroom and stuff like that. Right. But walking through the colds, uh, sounds weird at first, but it's just the, the, the you know, the, the difficult journey is what gets us the best and the most delightful results. We, we're now living in a place where we want everything automatic. 
we want to have the the bikini body guy then we want to have this and that and that's all fine and dandy but the real results the real things they come out of effort and placing your chips right so. mm. it makes me think about how um kind of reflecting on how confidence is built and how confidence has shown up in my life um from the point of view that i think kind of uh going through hardships makes you have to really fucking earn it. Like actually real strong, you know, triple X strength confidence that starts to get rebuilt after you've had some, some difficulty and because you have to earn it all. And I think, you know, growing up confidence is, is, is in some ways handed to us. I think it was handed to me when people are like, Oh, Tim, good job. Pat on the back. You've done a great thing. And I wasn't actually doing anything great. I was probably just, you know, finishing high school or something, but you know, we get a pat on the back and we get high fives and we go for the job promotion and we get the job. And it's kind of, so it's kind of like illusionary confidence that's attached to an amount of money or attached to a title or attached to a situation, which is very different from the type of confidence that we're able to cultivate when we're kind of leaning into fear, when we're getting close to something which feels uncomfortable and saying, you know, this feels terrible, but I know that I have to get through it. So I'm going to lean into it anyway. Um, it's kind of like growing something from a seed and starting from scratch, as opposed to just going out to the store and saying, Oh, I'll, I'll buy one of those 20 foot trees, please. You know, like bypass the work. Yeah. <laughs> but now I think about it, that knowing that you get from growing it from a seed, from having to have fed and watered and, and kind of rebuilt it, um, is way more powerful long term. And listen, I haven't cracked it still. I still doubt myself on many an occasion, uh, regularly every day. But there's, there's a bit of me that knows that I can get through things and that I can endure if I keep, you know, uh, putting, you know, the, the steps together. It completely is. It completely is uh, w one way of slicing it. And I, I, and I couldn't agree more with you on this side and I'm starting to worry because I agree with you on everything and I don't like that, man, but, <laughs> um, I'm very smart. So good for you. One way of slicing it is the old type of confidence comes from pecking order confidence. Let's say having a bigger, uh, bigger title or running faster or being uh, better at ping pong. I don't care. It, it, com it comes from, you know, being in a, in the higher up in the pyramid, right? Or from external factors or people tell, telling you like, Oh yeah, Tim, good boy. You keep at it. You keep selling those uh, widgets and you're going to be one day, this is all going to be yours, my son. Right. So, so in a, in a sense, the seed analogy makes, makes, makes sense, of course, because you water the seed and you see it germinate and grow and this and that, and then it becomes robust. And then the confidence comes from within and you start to sprinkle it or, or, or what's happening right now for me is I'm starting to sprinkle it around. So when that happens and, and, and mind you, there's a very thin line between being confident and being cocky. No. So we're talking about the real deal, being confident, being quiet. No, not, not, not being loud, not being, you know, like pounding our chest uh, situations. We know that. And your listeners know that as well. Right. But, uh, that type of confidence attracts people and situations that are much higher quality than the, um, the, the skill based confidence. Yeah. And that, to me, that speaks to like the, the skill based confidence is the, you know, the more of the egotistical chest beating stuff. It's not the, the deeper knowing that we kind of talked about. And, you know, we, that, that knowing type confidence is, is, is still questioned. Sometimes we still get the old imposter syndrome. We still get, you know, can I do this kind of running through the back of our minds, but 
the the strength is totally different and i use the analogy sometimes the house built on sand is the one where we're, we're kind of told that everything's fine and we're okay the what happens when we go through the adversity is we rebuild that house we put steel in the basement we put concrete in the basement and we're forced to to really uh, forge a much stronger foundation so it still gets windy outside the wind still blows the rain still comes but this time we have the strength, the confidence to withstand it and kind of move on to a brighter day. And, you know, anxiety it, it makes us go into the fire sometimes to to kind of forge that strength. But, you know, ultimately, that's where, where it's really built, you know. And they, and they burn hot. Those fires burn hot. Yes, yes. And it makes me think that like that... Um, the the slow built confidence is just longer lasting right it's something that you can keep forever because you earned it it's different to being handed it and and kind of as we come out of this um you know imagine on the the other side with with the rebuilt confidence and also i think you know anxiety has its attributes it has its benefits i think it allows people to have more empathy i think it allows people to have more compassion i think it allows people to be better connectors to other humans and so if you combine those things the the renewed or rebuilt refortified confidence with the connection now you're onto something now you have something which you can't get externally yeah, of course. And, and of course, and, and it's the same parallel as, as the, the, the actual anxiety that we were talking about. The quick fix, there is no quick fix. It's just an illusion. So it doesn't mean that you have to suffer through dark days and this and that, and, you know, like walk on the coals for miles and miles, but you know, in, 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 in a weird sense, you have to. And, and you created this team because you had none of this when you were going through your, through, through the paces yourself, no? you, you suffered alone in, in, in a, in a, in a certain sense. And, and that, that makes suffering 10 X or a hundred X or a thousand times. But now there's this drive and there's this connection and, and people can listen to this and people can tap into this and say, okay. This is exactly how I'm feeling. This is exactly what's going on. I'm not so weird. I'm not, I'm not so this, dysfunctional. This is, this is a common theme in the world. How can we best uh, proceed? No? And, the, and, the, and as we, not, not, not found out, but as, as we uh, uh, saw in Ireland and, uh, and, um, you know, and, 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 and got tangible proof of that again and again and again and again is one foot in front of the other. It's always that way. It's just as we grow, you know, wiser or older or, or, or bigger or whatever you want to call it, we come to the same conclusion and you and I come to the same conclusion. It's always bit by bit. It's always a foot in front of the other. And then there's times where a stretch is needed and you see something and you say, okay, this is within reach and I'm going to go for it. And that's, that's fine. But having built that base, right? So for people who are, you know, feeling misunderstood, feeling anxious, it's a terrible fucking feeling. It's fucking terrible. Whoever tells you that it's going to be fine and just breathe and, oh my God, you want to fuck them up. <laughs> You want to slap him across the face, you know, like two timing with the backhand because it, it feels so bad. And we acknowledge that, you know, I've been through that. It feels so bad, but it's just, as we say, going back to basics, one foot in front of the other is okay. I'm feeling this now. I am not in physical harm. I am not in the, you know, the 105th fifth floor of a building on a ledge. I am not that. I'm sitting in an office. I'm in an airplane flight. I'm, I'm driving my car. I'm watching TV and this is happening. You are not in danger of dying. That's what, that's what we get confused at, right? Because me, what I was, I thought was happening. I was dying right now, right? So it amped, it amped up my anxiety, but 
the only way to get, not to get over anxiety, but to use it to our advantage, you know, to, to do the jujitsu dance with the anxiety and use its power to our advantage is bit by bit building on it one foot in front of the other. Right. Yeah. And I think it's like, uh, I don't know whether it's a Chinese proverb or something, but it's, it says something like the easy way is the hard way. And, you know, for anxiety, it's like the, the long lasting change. As I say, stop coping, start changing is changes to our lives, which might mean, you know, a morning walk and some meditation for somebody. And for somebody else, it might mean you're in the wrong job or you live in the wrong place and there's bigger changes to be had. But, um, you know, that's really where it comes in, in terms of like the lasting change is the stuff which is a bit more difficult. And, you know, we, we often look for the miracle cure and it's natural in the system we're in to go and get the pill to try and fix it. Um, but, and, you know, as a, a, another thing I always say with the medication is that for a lot of people, it doesn't work and makes them feel worse. And that's my own experience of speaking to a lot of people who've been using the the drugs. But many people say to me, Tim, can I uh, take the medication and just stay in my current situation that I don't like and everything will be all right that way. And I'm like, eh, that's not how it works, my friend. Uh, things actually might need to change for you. You know, they can't stay the same. There's a reason for it. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry to tell you this. I'm sorry, but uh, it's not going to work. No, no, no. And listen, I'm guilty of this as well. I had the same same thing happen in my life. I was working with our friend Philip, and I went to him and said, "Hey, Phil, um, you know, I think I said, am I broken or is my situation making me anxious?" And you know, he kind of turned around and very profoundly said, "Why don't you change your situation and see what happens? Change your life and see if you still feel anxious." Which is fucking easy for him to say. I had to actually do the work. But <laughs> <laughs> That fucking leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, you know, that conversation, even though we mock it and make fun of it, that was the beginning of my second life. Somebody had given me permission to choose a different future, given me permission to do something differently. And from that moment forward, I was like, wow, I actually, although this is uncomfortable and desperate and horrible, I get to choose, which is so important. And you're, uh, and to be honest... You're a living, breathing example that these things work. They do work. Mm -hmm. It's com clinically proven that they work. <laughs> okay. But the, the, it's, it's at some, sometimes it seems insurmountable. Mm. It seems like too much. It seems like we, we should have started five years ago. Or, or we're going to start Monday, that mythical unicorn laden land of Monday, right? Yeah. The, 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 where the rainbow turns into a pot of gold Monday. <laughs> There's no fucking things, no such thing as Monday. Even if it's a Monday right now, but in, in the metaphorical sense, okay? So there's no such thing as Monday. The best time to start is now. Right now, not in half an hour or an hour or a week, right now. If people are not fulfilled or are feeling bad about the choices they make, about the, the way their life is structured, change one thing a little tiny bit right now right now. Yep. There's no better time. This is the best of times. There's, there's never been a best time to start than now. Fuck it. I think that is a, a beautiful place to leave it. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate like the, the purpose of doing this episode and maybe future ones, if people like it, is that this, these are conversations which you and I have in, in real life, in normal life anyway, and we've kind of sat around and said, oh, we should probably share those. So I just want to acknowledge you and say thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing, you know, a lot of your uh, <laughs> story, sharing a lot of your own stuff and, and kind of making it available for other people to listen to. No, man, this is I, I love this. I, uh, I and this is this was a seed that was planted to to continue with the seed thing when 
we were having a chat and we said like, fuck man, we should record something for tap. This would be very beneficial because we were getting insights, you know, and breaking views and boom, boom, boom. And we were having this sort of uh, idea dance that we said uh, would be cool to put down on tape. Absolutely. If, if, if that's, if that's still a word, <laughs> <laughs> we can use it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is a this is a this has been a pleasure. This has been a pleasure. Yeah. All right, my friend. All the best. Thanks a lot. There you have it. That was my main man, Ricardo. I hope you enjoyed our chat. And if you did, send us an email, give us some feedback. I kind of feel like we might do those once in a while with Ricardo and come up for a, a, a catchy name for the series um, and just share some of the stories. These are insights that we're kind of having in our own lives and it seems fun to share them with you. If you have enjoyed listening to the Anxiety Podcast today, please on, head on over to iTunes or wherever you consume this and and leave a lovely review for us. I read them all. It brightens my day. I have a skip in my step when I get them. And uh, yeah, I'm a little bit excited about that. If you can't tell, if you have any show suggestions, guest suggestions, things you want me to talk about, issues you want me to address, please go to anxietypodcast.com. Click on the contact page and send me a message. I would love to hear from you. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.